good afternoon, everyone from Bern, Switzerland. Uh, my name is Aga Vieloja, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the research project Activating Fluxus, founded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. I would like to welcome everyone who is joining us today from all over the world. And uh, I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces on our attendee list, actually names rather than faces, because I cannot unfortunately see your faces in this format. It is my pleasure to welcome our guest, Julia Robinson, and my colleague, Josephine Ellis, a doctoral candidate in this project, who will moderate this lecture together with me. Uh, I'm greeting everyone also on behalf of the project leader, Professor Hannah Huling, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, and activating Fluxus members and associates who are amongst the public. This lecture came together due to a generous founding from the Swiss National Science Foundation and was made possible thanks to the support of the research department and the Institute of Mass Reality of Arts and Culture at the Bern University of Arts. So I will just briefly introduce our project uh, for those who are uh, our first time guests. Um, so Activating Fluxus is a research project based in Bern University of Arts. It examines the lives and afterlives of Fluxus objects, events, and ephemera created in the 1960s and 1970s internationally. We believe that Fluxus transformed creative practice by questioning the dominant preconception of the artwork as something that endures unchanged. The creative outputs of Fluxus reject any stable material form and are inherently fluctuating. Our project seeks new ways to engage with the legacy of Fluxus through the lens of conservation, art history, performance studies, heritage studies, and museology, with implications for how we can conceive and preserve uh, inherently changeable artworks that have emerged since the 1960s. Um, so maybe before uh, we introduce our today guest, I will go through the housekeeping rules of this event. Um, Julia's lecture will be around 45 minutes long, and after that, we will open the floor to the questions from the public. However, feel free to start typing your questions into the chat or Q&A feature already during the lecture, and we will address those questions after Julia's talk. In the Q&A session, you can both type your questions in the chat or the Q&A feature, and me and Josephine will re read them out loud. <coughs> also, uh, raise your hand and we will invite you to ask your questions directly. This is a Zoom webinar format, so we cannot see the image of the person asking the question, unfortunately. We can only hear the voice. Um, and this event is being recorded. And <laughs> we're just double checking if it's being. And the recording will be shared on our website after the event. Um, okay, so over to you, Josie. Thank you, Aga. Um, so Julia Robinson is Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art in the Department of Art History at New York University. Her research ranges widely and concerns topics in art since the 1960s through contemporary art, score and language-based artistic strategy, strategies, performance and performativity from fluxus through the present, and the shift from medium to media in contemporary art. She has curated exhibitions on Fluxus and adjacent subjects at the Museum Ludwig Cologne, Barcelona Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Reina Sofia National Art Centre in Madrid. She is editor of the October Fars volume on John Cage and is currently working on a monographic study of George Brett, forthcoming as an October book in uh, MIT Press in 2024. And I think she has one more thing to add to this biography. So yes, over to you, Julia. Thank you both. Um, thanks to Hannah for inviting me and Ava and Josephine for making it um, happen. Uh, the one extra thing that we were talking about might be nice to add um, onto that list is that um, I'm also co-curating an exhibition on Henry Flint in Venice. Um, so it's sort of, it actually starts with Flint and Matunas and their architecture ideas in 65. And then it goes, um, you know, Flint revisited architectural propositions in what he called concept art architecture. Um, so we've got like a, a lot of beautiful drawings as, as kind of 
um, utopian models of, of um, building that he did in the 2000s. Um, so that's happening in sync with the architecture Biennale. Anyway, so it's wonderful to be here today and I think it's a, um, a crucial and exciting project. Um, so I drafted a more formal lecture several times and then I decided it might be actually more fruitful to move a little more freely around some of the issues that strike me as important and which need identifying and clarifying in new ways. Um, so I'm going to put the PowerPoint on now. Okay. So long ago now, it's two decades, uh, John Hendricks, who was the curator of the Silverman Collection, and the, which is the biggest collection of fluxes pretty much in existence, 15,000 objects, went to MoMA in 2005. Um, and he's also Yoko Ono's curator. So he put together this exhibition and catalogue, which posed the question, what's fluxus, what's not, and why? At that time, I was a little skeptical of this. In fact, I was working in Hendrix's office every day, um, cataloging uh, Breck's notebooks. So we kind of, I saw it up close. Um, so I was a little skeptical of this idea. You know, Hendrix, as the artist, Fluxus artists often s lament, uh, has had, you know, already held a great deal of sway over um, Fluxus um, because of the Silverman collection. So this seemed to presuppose final words and if not judgments, you know, about what counts as fluxes. Um, now, those of us who know fluxes might feel confident about identifying what is and what is not. But the question for us today is, will people in the future? Um, for that, we need to dig more deeply into rationales and raisons d'etre um, in performance, and also in object making. Um, and there are many other issues that you know, may help us define fluxus without judging, such as um, the coll collective performance. Um, one notable figure who never participated with the other fluxus artist is Yoko Ono. So do we, how do we speak of fluxus, fluxus collectivism um, when, you know, in, in with respect to her? So, just kind of raising some knotty issues. Um, uh, so what's extraordinary about Fluxus is its total diversity from its members hailing from three continents and their skill sets to the materials the artist chose. Um, and with that, they ushered in post-medium and post-disciplinary, the, the shift that we associate um, with the 60s. So. Let's just look at um, these slides. These slides are from Hendrix's book, What's Fluxus, What's Not, and Why. Now, once we um, sort of, um, I mean, just these, there's, there's more, but um, I just wanted to do one, one setup. Um, to show how questions arise um, about what might have been Hendrix's criteria of judgment. Um, and, you know, uh, what's early, what's late, um, and does that disqualify something or not? And then, of course, the Silverman collection has pushed quite a lot um, George Machunas's role. So the, there's, there could be the idea that if George Machunas never touched it, then it's not fluxes, right? Um, I'm not weighing in on that, um, but... Uh, you know, so Klaus Oldenburg, obviously not fluxus, but it's right in the middle of the decade when Matuna started making objects. Um, Joe Jones is considered fluxus, but this is not, Hendrix doesn't consider this a fluxus object. Um, so, and it's interesting, Jones is one of the few figures who really merges uh, the musical base of fluxus with art in, you know, literally. And I'll raise that as an issue too. So, um, and then we have the George Machunas. And because that's in 1975, and because 
Lamont Young protests that he has nothing to do with fluxus and does not want to be associated with fluxus, um, that, you know, where do we put this work? So this is just sort of an idea of how we start passing, P-A-R-S-E, the object production of fluxes. Um, now, I also want to sort of do a couple of genealogies, again, to help us think what is different about fluxes from precursors. So first of all, we have, you know, obviously the ready-made, um, but I tend to think that, um, I mean, what, what we have to say about the ready-made is that it, it's not meant to be interacted with, right? So it's removal from the world um, into the realm of non-function completes its, de its definition and or its status as a work of art, right? So fluxus, the, the move in fluxus is absolutely opposite. They bring function to the object. You sit in a brick chair, you know, you polish something or you, you know, activate, make a salad or whatever, but the ready-made factor in fluxus is, is kind of reverse ready-made because it reactivates the object. Um, so, you know, Cage is often, uh, John Cage is often sort of described as the one who brought chance methods to fluxus, but of course, these artists all knew about Duchamp's uh, work. And so the three standard stoppages was in MoMA on view for the American fluxus artists um, all the way through the 50s. Um, so that's sort of one model of chance that um, proceeds dramatically Cage's chance, but I'll get onto Cage's in a moment. And then the small glass, I just put that there for, uh, to make reference to the anti-retinal in Duchamp. Um, and that's very important in the 60s, more important than it's, than it's often given credit for, because um, the ready-made seems to drown out everything in discussion. But the, the anti-retinal is, can be um, described as, you know, the motivation for, auditory, tactile, works that are experienced in other ways than looking, right? Um, and in fact, the way that, um, if you read the, the bar, horizontal bar across, that runs across this, um, it famously says to be looked at, in French, to be looked at um, close to from the other side of the glass for almost an hour. Um, so if you're reading it, you're on the wrong side of the glass. You have to move around, right? So I would call this the first instruction piece of the 20th century. Um, so this is just kind of widen how we think of the genealogy of fluxes. Um, and now I know that you've had some discussion of um, also, you know, um, like how do you how you deal how museums deal with objects once they have them? And you know, one example I was aware of was um, MoMA. MoMA bought George Breck's repository in 1961 when it was the Art of Assemblage show. And many years later, one of Breck's biggest collectors came to see it, asked to see it in the museum storage. And this silver Christmas ball that you see um, on the right hand, top right of the, the grid um, was broken. And the conservators were busy trying to glue the Christmas ball back together. And, um, you know, this collector said, don't you understand George Breck's meaning always? I mean, get another one, replace it. You, you know, you don't want to fetishize it by gluing back the original, you know, Christmas ball. And it's very hard to do anyway, right? Um, so there's that. And then there's this sort of interactive factor. Um, so it, and, and, you know, these, this triplicate sort of shows about the, the scoring relationship, even to objects that he made earlier than fluxes. So the score on the right, incidental music, he actually, you know, named this work play incident. So it's got the incidental in it. You're supposed to pick up the ping pong ball, put it in the top and let it, you know, and it makes music because there's um, nails in the middle with, with rubber. So it's ding, 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 you know, all the way down. Now, obviously it said it is said over and over again that we can't play with these anymore and we can't interact. So, you know, you know, what can we make of them? Again, that seems like totally platitude to raise that um, because it has been discussed so much, but also um, it seems worthwhile continuing to discuss it on, on another level. Um, 
So, I mean, I just recently saw this Walter de Maria show and his work also is like drop the ball in the box, do this, you know. And so it, it's sort of the issue of how to represent interactive pieces um, is sort of growing and changing all the time as well. Um, uh, I was going to say, yeah, okay. Uh, and museums often make mistakes or they don't understand exactly what they're meant to do. There's a very famous example of um, this document I just mentioned by Machunas and Henry Flint, um, which it's called Communists Must Give Revolutionary Leadership in Culture. And it's, um, it's a broadsheet folded um, with a sample of building material. It's sort of a critique of design and, and Machunas uh, gets a sample of the building material that he wants, um, you know, he wants to demonstrate to the public. And then he wraps it in, in very efficiently, as he always does, in plastic and uses it as a mailing envelope. Now, when this thing arrived at the Pompidou, they threw away the building material because they thought it was packaging. So, you know, um, so destroyed the work, basically. Um, uh, so accidents do happen. That's why we keep having to have these kind of conversations. Um, now, I think um, we, we also want to think about, you know, Brecht used the term arrangement um, early on, and arrangement has this connotation of music, right? So you say an arrangement by a composer. Um, so, you know, Joseph Cornell is often brought up with these box forms, but, you know, Cornell is, is quite different because largely on the basis that, that you don't interact with a Cornell either, right? And the time in a Cornell tends to be more nostalgic, more deep time, um, rather than the sort of the moment of the now that Brecht's interested in. Um, I think when Natalie Harron spoke to this group uh, late last year, she was mentioning um, something about Brecht saying there's no catastrophes possible. So this is a, a beautiful um, sort of set of instructions that Brecht gave to um, the museum, several museums when the Art of Assemblage show uh, traveled. He actually didn't send repository. I think Mo MoMA wasn't gonna lend it. And so he sent this medicine cabinet. Um, I think it's just worth reading for us to um, you know, ponder it. So, and, and it's really crucial for how the artist feels versus how the conservator, cura, you know, curator, all the different players around the artwork feel. So the aspect of this work, which to me is of most interest is not the object like part, that is the cabinet and its contents, but rather what occurs when someone is involved with its object like part. That is the work to me is more in the nature of a performance music and dance than of an object. It is therefore of the greatest importance that the spectator participant be free to open and close the door handle, the door and handle the objects freely. In this way, both major phases of the work, the placid reflective phase of the closed cabinet and the manifold changing phase of the interior are open to him. Um, so it's within the spirit of the work as it, that as in life in general, um, parts may be lost, broken, spilled, stolen, replaced, contributed, soiled, cleaned, constructed, destroyed. How should an, exhi an exhibitor cope with this? First, by relaxing. <laughs> I love that line. Um, no conservator relaxes, I don't think. Um, so since I completely absolve, I absolve him completely of all responsibility for returning the work in its original form. Um, secondly, by doing what seems to him appropriate to do. When our shoes wear out, we have them resold without fuss. When and if parts disappear, replace these with parts that seem equivalent and able to substitute. If no equivalent pass, parts are available, substitute something else or nothing if you'd rather, right? So that kind of holding back actually is in the spirit of the work. Um, so then he says, everyone will do what's appropriate. No catastrophes are possible. And then this is like, it continues the last bit. May as well read it. It's beautiful. The clock keeps interesting to me erratic time. One might attempt to make it agree with other clocks at the risk of stopping it forever. 
or substitute another simple clock. The bottle is shipped empty, but for exhibition it may be filled to perhaps a third or half its volume with a clear drinkable liquid, preferably, preferably cranberry juice, but also possibly water or wine. The wide mouth jar is to contain something herb or spice-like, preferably in seed form, though it may also contain candy. Right, so this is, um, uh, you know, the, the, it's sort of like emphasizing the temporal, of course, and so the seeds will sprout and then, you know, they have a life of their own. The bottle at the bottom that has liquid in it, he didn't notice he didn't say fill it up to the top because that looks kind of sealed and untouchable. If it's like a little bit down, it, it looks like, you know, everyone's started to be involved with the work, right? So all of these criteria actually have absolutely critical um, references in, in Breck's project, you know, um, he so, but he always makes them as light as possible and as kind of jokey, even childlike sometimes, you know, but actually they're fulfilling very rigorous criteria. So it's worth us taking them seriously. Now, um, I want to get on to um, the, the role of Cage um, in and what and therefore the role of music in fluxus. Um, so I know that improvisation versus indeterminacy, well, improvisation only came up in um, again in Natalie Harron's talk. Um, and one of the questions that I found quite interesting um, was, you know, a, an artist who said, you know, I improvise, that's what I do. And one would think that an open score allows for that. And it's worth explaining, you know, Natalie sort of said, no, you can't. And she started to describe a good work and a bad work or a good interpretation and a bad one. I think it's, it's good also for us to give a historical reason for the kind of lurch in logic. Um, so, uh, so Cage um, famously hated improvisation. Um, so it comes from him. And he did have a sense that people could do his works badly or well. Um, there's, so there's all these sort of occasions when people interpret them jokily, orchestras, you know, revolted against him, you know, his piece. Um, so he had good reason. And he, of course, pushed it by playing in concert halls and not, you know, keeping it in that formal frame. Um, so Cage is, uh, you know, he'd always, he had this progression of um, incorporating unexpected things into his scores. So as early as 1939, Imaginary Landscape, the very first, it'll be a long series, um, says, you know, it's a piece for records of constant and variable frequencies, large Chinese symbol and a string piano. So that string piano is something that um, his mentor, Henry Cowell invented, but it becomes the prepared piano, which is quite different. The string piano, you play the strings. Um, so when he invented the prepared piano, um, there had to be instructions of where you place the various objects that he's suggesting to mute the sound or make it more tinny and metallic or you know, to, to change the feeling of the piano. Now, it's not a cage lecture, but I, I just um, wanted to point to this slide in the upper center section, which looks quite like a little fluxus object in certain ways, right? Um, and it's hard to know whether the cage trust photographed it so beautifully like that, influenced a little bit by fluxus. Um, these are what these are, or whether Fluxus artists knew about it and, you know, were influenced by Cage. So in, it's in the 1940s that he develops a prepared piano. Um, so this box, actually, it's very beautiful. It contains a, a whole lot of envelopes with these little, can you see my arrow, by the way, when I move the arrow? So with objects like this um, in it, and it's weather stripping and screws and various sized, um, you know, tools and things and you know he 
did all this trial and error and some things fell down and didn't work. So anyway, he's basically got the collection of things that you need to make a prepared piano, right? Um, and so that is a, kind of an important precursor. And he writes the distance from the bridge of the piano um, where they're meant to be, all meant to be in, you know, arranged. So, you know, he gives you very clear instructions. Um, and he even developed instructions right down to the kind, the brand of the piano, like a Steinway. Um, so it's it's very important that we sort of know, know and think about this precedent. Now, um, so Cage, it, it, there's a lot of confusion that must be cleared up if we're to understand and set, sort of divide up what Fluxus had done in relation to music, in relation to chance. Um, it's none of these things, it's a development of. So um, this is just to sort of to briefly discuss uh, Cage's huge leap in the 50s from his first effort at composing with chance using the I Ching um, and the piece called Music of Changes, right? So that's um, he used the I Ching to decide every aspect of this piece of music from, you know, amplitude to instrument to sound, silence, starting, timing, everything, right? So at the end of it, uh, it was done. It was complete. And he criticised himself saying it's never going to sound any different. It's never going to change, right? So even though he put himself with David Tudor performing it to the hardest test of you know, tossing um, coins or yarrow sticks to, to have the I Ching answer every aspect of it, um, what they'd made is something fixed, right? So that critique led Cage to develop what he called specifically indeterminacy. So chance and indeterminacy are two different things. Um, and, and chance, he even develops that word to chance operations. So he's he's got a lot of people he's competing with um, in the musical world that are starting introduce starting to introduce the aleatory, um, which is another word for chance, of course. So he he doesn't want it to be Dada-ish, just saying chance. He wants it to be, you know, seemingly more rigorous. So chance operations is a term that he uses. And then towards the end of the 50s, he retools the word, the existing word, indeterminacy. Um, and he famously said that the composer handing a performer, handing a score to a performer that they had to play exactly. And then the performer doing that for an audience creates a police situation where, you know, everyone's sort of stuck doing what, what was intended. And what he wanted was that everyone to have more freedom and, you know, be able to change aspects of the score and therefore even surprise him about what it sounded like in the end. So, so indeterminacy is when, you know, on the right, you've got the um, Fontana mix um, and the transparencies. So you get to decide, you know, what uh, variables you'll choose. And then you put the grid over it and you, you kind of work out your timing and everything um, as the performer. So you take Cage's parts and you put it together in your own way. So that's obviously um, brushes up with fluxes. Um, and of course, as the, you know, this very moment, actually a little bit before is when Duchamp gives the lecture, the creative act saying the spectator must complete, can, completes the work, right? So we might even imagine that Cage had that in mind when he made Fontana mix. Um, and famously, um, Yvonne Rayner used this score to, um, for a dance. So it just shows how, um, you know, how it's it's usable, not only for music, you know, but for whatever you might want it to be used for. Um, all right, so the main source of the music in uh, role in Fluxus is um, at least in the new, well, it's very interesting. Most of the Fluxus artists in the beginning all either had musical training. If you think of Mieko Shiomi and, um, <clears throat> I guess Toshi Ishinagi wasn't exactly Fluxus, but, you know, he was part of this music scene in Japan. Um, many other figures, uh, Kasugi, others all were doing experimental music things in Japan. Then you have 
Emmett Williams joining a whole lot of the German artists in Wiesbaden, Cologne, you know, and and uh, uh, Darmstadt, uh, and Pike goes to Darmstadt. And then in New York, you have Cage confronting this class, asking them if they know about music, and no one practically says yes, you know. So he's like, right, we're really starting from scratch here. Um, so he has all these artists there feeling that the limitations of their own media, right? So why I say this is because it's what we find, I mean, you know, it's, this subtle distortion in fluxes is that some objects fluxes artists made are props. So, and they're meant to be props. They're not meant to be, you know, worshipped as great works of art. Another thing is that there are so many musicians that it changes the status of the objects they make because they're not artists, right? I'll just leave that in the air for the moment. Um, and so you see all these figures who, who kind of were in Fluxus or nearby, um, Alan Capra and Brecht and Al Hansen, Dick Higgins, Jackson Macklow, uh, and so on. So um, this kind of contingent of figures took time and said, we want to put time into the work of art, right? We're, we're sick of abstract expressionist painting. So how are we going to do that? We're going to need to work out how the score functions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obvious but necessary to keep saying that Fluxus was based on the musical score. We, we all know this, but it's worth putting on the table at the outset and reminding ourselves that this is a crucial element that differentiates fluxes from conta uh, contemporaneous initiatives, like happenings on the one hand and conceptual art on the other. So, so it's the musical score base that does that. Um, if you think about happenings, people tend to generalize and say, oh, everything in the 60s was participatory. You know, Alan Capro's 18 Happenings in Six Parts, just to pick the classic one, moved the audience between things that they'd see, but didn't invite the audience up the front and say, you do it, you know. And Robert Whitman also did interesting things with the audience, but never really, never asked them to participate. So Happenings tended, Whitman didn't usually have a script, just some ideas, and Capro did have a script. So Fluxus again is is differentiated, different, and it should be made to be felt different. Um, so it took the content of daily experience um, through the vehicle of the score and arranged it for a new kind of attention, art-like attention, as they called it, as one artist called it. Um, so we could say that early fluxus gave form, real and potential, to intention and attention. Um, and split the creative input in half, composed into composing and realizing. So I lay this out to flag the root of the key subject in ha handling fluxus material, object status, uh, post ready-made. So after the ready-made, what is the status of the object in the work? Um, so we have this, some objects that are um, a result of a score performance model, um, and then they're not used after that. And actually there, there was some fetishization. I don't mean to take Silverman as the target because we would be, we're so lucky that they did what they did, but there was some fetishization of things that were clearly props in the Silverman, you know, and they made it into kind of great works of art. And, and it's wonderful for us because they're documents of what happened, but they're not necessarily works of art. Um, so, you know, any one realization is modified by others. Um, so we've got to sort of think about what that does to how we handle the objects. Um, so as I said, Joe Jones was one of the few that um, sort of integrated this the musical aspect and the sculptural. Um, all right, so now if we move on, um, so cage classes in the late 50s, and then there's um, the, the beginning of Fluxus, right? Um, let me just, we want to put on, you guys are playing the video, right? 
So I unshare. So I just want to play you a little clip. Some, many people will have seen it, but it just kind of brings what we're discussing to life a little bit. This is the first concert in Wiesbaden in 1962. Not the yucky man with the beard. Luxusfestspiele in Wiesbaden. Böse Bubenhände haben in die Plakate vor dem Konzertsaal bereits einen Kommentar geritzt. Eine Kritik zu den Festspielen neuester Musik. Man beachte, neuester. Neu klänge viel zu altmodisch. Das hier sind die Interpreten. Und es handelt sich keineswegs um Vorschusslorbeeren, die sie sich selbst spenden. Es handelt sich bereits um das erste Werk des Abends. Silenzium. Das Publikum, meist Jugendliche, weiß noch nicht so recht. Muss man ernst bleiben? Darf man schmunzeln? Der Herr mit Hut ist übrigens der Initiator der Fluxusfestivität, George Metzunas aus USA. Die musikalische Welt war lange genug im Lot, sagte er sich. Jetzt wollen wir sie mal gründlich auf den Kopf stellen. Je schräger, desto besser. Schräge Musik, sagten sich die Kameraleute, muss man mit den eigenen Waffen schlagen. Was die Dadaisten können, können wir schon lange. Die alte Musik ist zu künstlich, behaupten die Neo-Dadaisten. Wir wollen natürlich sein. So sieht das dann in der Praxis aus. Das Publikum teilt sich in zwei Lager. Ein kleines, das Parallele zieht zu Ionesco und Beckett. Das wesentlich größere Lager zieht aber kurzweg Parallelen zum Zirkus. Faule Tomaten flogen trotzdem nicht. Man war tolerant und hatte seinen Spaß. Von Benjamin Patterson stammen die Variationen für Kontrabass. Anno 1962 kommt ein Bassist mit Instrument und Bogen nicht mehr aus. Er braucht einen ganzen Koffer voll Requisiten. Diese Art von Kunst scheint jedenfalls nicht am Hungertuch zu nagen. aus einer Komposition von Emmett Williams. Ihr Titel, ein zweifelhaftes Lied in vier Richtungen für fünf Stimmen. Wir hoffen, verehrte Zuschauer, dass Ihnen der tiefere Sinn dieses Opus schon nach den ersten Takten aufgegangen ist. Wenn nicht, Trösten Sie sich mit einem Werk von Lamont Young, Komposition 1960, Nummer 10. Wohlgemerkt, es handelt sich um Musikfestspiele. Zweifellos ein Virtuose auf Tusche und Papierband. Man beachte den musikalischen Hinterkopf. Nachdem man sich bereits so tief zur Erde niedergelassen hat, können wir dem Finale des Abends gefasst ins Auge sehen. 
Welches Tier ist das Klavier? Still, friedlich und bescheiden und muss dabei so mancherlei erdulden und erleiden. Wilhelm Busch scheint etwas vorausgeahnt zu haben. Und rasend wild, das Herz erfüllt von mörderischer Freude, durchwühlt er dann, soweit er kann, des Opfers ein Geweide. Piano Activities nennt sich diese Komposition. Es war einmal ein Flügel. Sollten andere Städte eifersüchtig werden, Gemach, die Dada-Musiker gehen auf Tournee. Kopenhagen, Paris und Düsseldorf stehen auf ihrer Liste. O oh, seliger Mozart, keine Furcht, deine Musik darf immer noch den Haupteingang benutzen. Does he able to put the PowerPoint? Yeah. Does he? Yeah. Can you put the PowerPoint or should I? I can, should I? Yeah, is that? Now I don't see. Wait, I don't see. All right. Sorry, guys. All righty. So um, we've seen that that uh, clip. Many people have seen that before. But it's good to refresh ourselves on how the objects are used and the kind of object status. So we saw first Olivetti, um, Atunis's in memoriam to Adriano Olivetti, people going up and down, the umbrella going up. And then you see Pike, Namjoon Pike, sort of using two rocks, I mean, two uh, bits of wood, very kind of off cut um, to make this clonk, clonk, clonk sound, right? So do we keep those two pieces of wood, right? And what do we do with them, right? Or do we keep um, Benjamin Patterson's contrabass after he's fed it and pumped it up with a bicycle pump and all these things? Do we keep that as like a fetish object or something? Um, and the, obviously the same could be said of the piano. And the, at the end, right, the piano gets totally destroyed. And, of, and the uh, news reporters, um, you obviously gleaned, uh, were very critical of it, but thank God they got captured it because we have that record. Um, so it's just a matter of sort of um, seeing, you know, how the artist handled things and then that sort of setting us a little straight on, you know, what is our job for the future. Um, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, so the first piece you saw is Olivetti, um, there, then you saw another extraordinary piece that we'll get to in a sec, um, Emmett Williams's Four Directional Song of Doubt. Now I see that it is 11.45, so I'm going to zoom, um, not zoom, zoom, but like I'm going to go fast um, to just kind of introduce a couple more things that I wanted to raise. So this is sort of about the music background. Nam Jim Pike's already in Germany when Fluxus starts to take off in 62. Um, Emmett Williams, what one might keep from that four directional song of doubt is this wonderful score. So each performer was given a score and they had an, a word. So what this might be you, this might be just, never, quite, no, right? So four directional song of doubt. And so you saw Alison Noll saying never and someone say you, you, you know, so that is like a perfectly beautiful and legitimate um, document to keep. Um, and then, you know, to re-realize the work. Uh, so Fluxus then comes to New York. Um, and with that, there's a shift, there's still performance, but there's a shift into object production. Um, and, you know, I've written before on the way in which Matunas's input turns those funny objects, some little props like the two blocks of wood into something uh, because of the beautifully designed labels, right? And they do strike me as what he called anti-commodities. So you have pop art happening and, and fluxes happening and they're, they're sort of opposing each other. Pop art's all in color, you know, sort of very clear brands and, and 
fluxes is in black and white and sometimes hard to read. Like you wouldn't necessarily know that that says George Brecht. And Matuda's had great fun with this one. Um, I don't know if anyone knows who that is, but it's anyway, it's, I can't see you, so I can't play the game, but um, it's Yoko Ono, right? So he made a Y, O, K, O, et cetera. And he made this poster saying, if you are too dumb to work out who this is, you know, and everything. So it was his sort of pranksterism. But in any case, they really were a force um, with all their own identity. And they, you know, we haven't explored fluxes enough, even in relation to pop. Um, so performances. Uh, I'm going to go past that, I think. Yeah, I was going to sort of discuss like the different approaches, different types of scores. Obviously, Dick Higgins is danger music when he screams is, is not something anyone could participate in. Um, and it's quite jarring. Um, then Thomas Schmidt, this is a beautiful piece, Zieglis für Wasserheimer or the Flaschen. And, and, you know, other people can perform that, it seems, and he wanted them to. So, that, you know, all, do we save the milk bottles, though? I don't think so, but, you know, this, so, it's all this worth discussing. Um, I, I love to reflect on when, I'm th when we're thinking about Machunas and what he did, the difference between what Io gave to him for the finger box and what Machunas made out of that. Right, so it gives them this kind of crispness, this status, the, this feeling of intention that there's something to be taken note of. And for those, everyone probably knows that you put your finger in and there's different materials. Um, so, and like it used to have foam rubber, which is now all rotten. Do we make it other boxes? What do we do with that? Um, okay, <laughs> well, we also need to know little things. I'm sort of anxious about time, but um, the idea of water yam was that the original idea was that the music, more music-like events were on the orange cards and the object-oriented events were on the white cards, right? So it's worth sort of thinking about that. Um, Alison Knowles, Again, sort of an issue for the conservator. The, the bean rolls have really sealed up, so you almost have to get a screwdriver to open it, and then it has real beans in it. And some of her works um, with beans actually, you know, gathered moss, moth and moths and everything because they're organic matter. Um, and actually, this brings me to I want to say something about what is fluxus, the gap, and everything, right? And Knowles had this beautiful way of putting it to the art dealer Emily Harvey when in the 80s when you know she was trying to call everyone fluxes and they'd sort of some of them had got over it a bit so this is just to restore the artist to as their own identity in a way so Alison Knowles wrote dear Emily the objects used in my artworks have always been commonplace often ephemeral and worn in special in a special way from, from their use. Um, I often use food in artworks, for example, beans. I interact with the working process automatically, letting materials speak for themselves. Useful or edited out, all random occurrences are welcome. Fragments make a shape. It's the same in the performances of the past few years. The radio plays particularly. The physical objects have their sound already existing, a wind up toy. Traditional instruments are uninteresting because their use takes skill of a musical sort and their classical framework is inhibiting. I researched the found sound object for its existing sound until I know it entirely. It is presented and rediscovered with the audience. Um, I use chance operations. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's cut, that cut off the last thing, but she basically said, um, Fluxus landed on us. We didn't, you know, and, and then we left. Like, so it was something that came and went. So that brings us back to the starting point of thinking how we can associate things with Fluxus or not. Um, Knowles definitely has a body of work that she doesn't consider Fluxus work. Um, okay, I'm going to finish here just showing you the last few slides. Oh. 
switch it off. Well, I have one um, quite beautiful anecdote to say about shoes of your choice um, and to sort of speak about that simplicity that Knowles was talking about when she said, I use simple things, I research them, I listen to them, right? So she decided that shoes were very interesting and that people had their reasons for loving a pair of shoes. So shoes of your choice, as we know, <clears throat> ask people to, you know, get up and speak about their shoes. Below you see the wonderful Jackson Macklow in one performance of it. Um, in when it's sort of started in London, Richard Hamilton apparently had this like high platform boot and he talked for 45 minutes. That is an artist supporting another artist in case no, if, if no one put their hand up, right? He really showed how it could be done. And the most moving event I saw was like maybe 10 years ago, Alison performed this at the White House for Obama and a very small group of people. Um, and it had just happened a little bit a few weeks before that someone threw a shoe at a, prime, a, a politician's head or something. So they weren't allowed, she wasn't allowed to ask people to take off their shoe and come up. So she improvised and did it herself. She got a, a musical stand, took her own shoe off, put it on there and started talking and said, you know, when I was a young girl in St Scarsdale, New York, my feet were so big that there was no shop there's no store to sell the right shoes to me. And so my parents had to take me into New York to these embarrassing stores, you know, big feet for big feet people. And the lady in the store would say, hey, sweetheart, you're not going to get the color you want. Did you expect that? You know, so she'd walk out with yellow shoes or something. Anyway, so she told this story and as she told it, um, you know, and, and all the kind of things that happened around it, you saw, I happened to be sitting quite near Obama and Michelle, and it felt like a story of difference, you know, and how something can, someone can be different. She was too tall, and so she couldn't fit into normal shoes. She was somehow not the norm, which is so violent in its, you know, expecting everyone to be equal. So that is a your beautifully simple fluxes score that everyone in this room in at the White House, no one knew about fluxes and everyone got it, right? And it was incredibly moving. So we've got a, a, our job as sort of custodians of all this work um, is to kind of keep the simplicity um, and at the same time care for the elements that teach about these objects, scores, and you know, remarkable interventions into the world in which we live. Thanks. Wow, thank you, Julia. That was a very beautiful lecture and uh, amazing uh, end of it. <laughs> wow, uh, yeah, um, I have to process all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but let's um, let's have a look at our uh, participants and uh, if anyone is already ready with any questions to Julia. No, no so. Okay. Oh, Natalie. <laughs> okay. Mm. I was I was actually thinking about one question, but um, I think I will give the floor to Natalie because she was mentioned <coughs> several times. So. Um, yeah, um, I'm allowing you to talk, Natalie. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a treat, Julia, to hear you talk about Fluxus. And I really enjoyed your foregrounding of the musical ontology of the works and the idea of composing versus realizing and also using Fluxus to kind of remind us of alternative aspects of both Cage and Duchamp's work since, um, I don't know, the way we understand them has, as you said, been, become ossified around certain ideas of chance or of the ready-made. Um, I have um, three follow-up questions that are kind of all tied together. So um, if you don't mind, um, I kind of continuing on this idea of the musical ontology, I was wondering, what you think would be the outcome if we were to fully take on a kind of musical preservation approach to the works, um, thinking about the work as not objects, but like a repertoire and maybe having authorized performers, which is something that a figure like Yvonne Rayner has done. 
Mm. Um, and related to that, I wonder what you, if you think that there is a continuity between how the scores and the objects should be treated and conserved, or do you think that they require different preservation models that um, might, uh, or just that they require preservation models that either are aligned or maybe like distinct, yet complementary in some way. Um, and lastly, on a more like pragmatic level, I was wondering if you could speak about some of the specific choices that you have made as a curator of this work, since you've done so much important curating around Fluxus and the kind of broader uh, kind of environment of work in the 60s. So I'm wondering if you, you did share some wonderful anecdotes, but I'm curious in, in your kind of own curatorial practice, just what are some of the decisions that you've made to kind of take a position in the landscape of curation and conservation of the work? Um, okay, so the third question is curating. The second, can you give me the first and the second, Natalie, just briefly? First the first one was about like what your what you think about um, the possibility of like really taking on a musical preservation approach, like treating right. the work like a repertoire rather than you kept referring to the objects as like props that are actually that are fetishized in a way I think it was sort of you were implying that this was like not not a way to deal with them in some cases yeah I guess I was and you said what would it accomplish right and then sorry the second one was what um was about like do you think there should be different approaches to the scores versus the objects or do they exist oh, yeah. in some sort of like conservation continuum and maybe should be treated similarly yeah, thank you so much. That was a lot, but I'm just so Ooh. curious um, your thoughts on these questions. Thanks. So the first thing about music, um, uh, and what it would accomplish for, for Fluxus, it just, um, you know, liberates it from all the kind of participatory things that are in the 60s that, that sort of run rife and they've been a source of generalisation, I think. Um, and we know that Fluxus is trying to get rid of the commodity object. So what does it mean when we preserve an object? Like, I, I, you know, Natalie, you did a wonderful job on Brex chairs, but um, there's one in the Silverman collection that's kind of um, doesn't, it's just a chair and uh, it's sort of, its status is quite unsure. But of course, I was very excited to see it but that, that I might have to criticize myself for that, you know, and certainly Brecht is, and Knowles and some others, Brecht's really determined that you substitute another object. Um, and, and I think a beautiful thing, I believe you talked about the table too, beautiful thing about table, chair, all these things is that everyone still understands what they are, right? 40 years later, 50 years later. So, you know, I often also give my class scores and get them to interpret things. And if it was some thing kind of localized to 1964, you know, that we don't have anymore, um, it would be, you know, a whole different story. But they they find them very easy to realize, right? So we got to we've got to take that seriously. And and this everyday thing, I correct, wouldn't have probably wanted anyone to hang on to anything. Um, uh, like object like um, and he would have sort of been interested in all the possible different uh, interpretations right so um, the music side um, also I think a, a work like Breck's um, solo for contrabass da, 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 polishing I think when he's sitting polishing the instrument I think that's another anti-retinal. So it's another Duchamp, Duchamp effort to, the, in a sense, the music basis gives us an anti-retinal proposition with many of the artists that we can then think differently about the objects that, you know, the, the works that we know kind of very well, right? And then, you know, you have Pike's engagement. Well, anyway, I'll stop there with that. So different score objects. Yes, the scores, I love to see the old scores. I also think it's important if it wasn't even carried through though, of um, Matunas publishing, um, you know, at Brecht's behest one assumes the, the scores in two different types, the orange and the, the white. 
the orange signaling music and the white knot. Now, this doesn't completely hold up. As we know, Machinus was um, working with exigencies and, you know, you know but anyway, it's, it is a nice way to think about the distinction of event scores. Um, so it, those kind of things, it's beautiful that they exist. It's, you know, but they're obviously paper. So you deal, you can serve paper in a different way that you can serve objects. And they're the beginning, they are Brexit, right? Um, with Alison Knowles, you know, you can't really imagine that proposition number two or any of the pieces um, having some residue that you have to separate and treat differently, right? Um, so this difficult territory, I think, is what we need to kind of be treading. And, um, you know, I mean, I would say also that, you know, Brecht once said that um, scores should be published in the newspaper and should be available for everyone, right? So I don't think he'd even care that we had the original Wardiam scores. But for us, it's very important. Number one for scale. So we see that it's handheld. It's not like a clumsy object that's too big or, you know, is two pages that, you know, you can just look at it and do it. Um, and the other thing may be for, yeah, the, the book as the uh, box as a mailer, this sort of fusion between yam and fluxus, because it says it's called wadiam. Um, and, you know, there's lots of uh, information there. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if that answered. And then curating, what have I come across? Well, um, People often steal things <laughs> when you lay out objects on a table or something. So you've got to put out things that you don't mind being stolen. Um, and, but I do think, you know, like the orange on the table or on the chair, you know, various things, even his calendar that he, you want to rip off every day. If you don't do that, you, you haven't got the piece. <clears throat> and I always remember Casper Koenig opening the catalogue you know, his introduction to my Brecht retrospective catalogue saying, you know, basically we shouldn't be doing this show at all, right? So, um, yeah, I, so that's the, that was the curatorial challenge. Um, yeah, and it's, it, it remove, it's one remove, like at the Reina Sophia, I had a table and chairs um, with the wine glass and plate and everything, and it's like I could now I can be critical of myself. I loved it at the time, but now I could say probably who ate there, who sat there. Is there the feeling of those objects having been used, right? Because that is the difference between a Duchamp and a Brecht, right? So, um, so if you just set it up, it's a little artificial, maybe. Um, you know, maybe you have someone use it or, and, you know, in a lot of the correspondence, he says, you know, kick it around or, you know, take something that's already, he wanted the evidence of use. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that answers you a bit, Natalie. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Mm. I'm can I, if I, if I may just ask a follow-up, are there, um, are there other exhibitions of Fluxus you've seen that you thought did a really good job of X, Y, or Z? Um, I, I think uh, I'm not like a hundred percent behind it, but I think Christoph Sharrick's couple of installations at MoMA, one where he like put, and um, we're talking, Natalie and I are talking about Brick because we work a lot on Brick, but um, I should mention lots of other names. But anyway, he put the one event score high up on the wall and in other places where they kind of occur, you know, rather than perfectly neat in a case. Um, and there was a second oh yeah that think thought show it was kind of nice that the artist came in and, and moved it round. um i i really think it's very hard to do i in some you know maybe you want to show an archival photo and actually just buy all new things and put them in you know the various interactive works um it's really hard to know what to do i've done a mix in the past um but i think that christoph is trying to work with that quite intelligently um, <clears throat> particularly since MoMA pro probably puts even more pressure on curators having everything hermetically sealed than other places. I think in Europe, not maybe not Switzerland, but in, um, you know, uh, like Barcelona, it was like they let me do a few things which were sort of slightly breaking the conservation rules. Um, so anyway, it, it's a continuing challenge. Um, thank you. Um, that was a very interesting um, 
exchange, I would say. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Natalie, for your questions as well. We have one question uh, in the Q&A, and um, I'm wondering, Jules, do you want to ask it to yourself, or uh, should we... Um, I will enable you to say yes or no, okay? If I find you in the list. Yes. We are, you are allowed to talk, Jules. Well Hi. 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 Um, <laughs> nice, to you. America, nice to see you. Switzerland, Julia. America. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's. Uh, I think my question is in a way kind of kind of predictable, um, based on 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 the kind of overlap between the the my involvement with with John Hendricks and your involvement with John Hendricks, mm. Julia. But you know, basically, my my perspective is that uh, while I completely agree about this problem of fetishization, I think it really comes from this really important and valuable contribution that Hendrix made was which was forcing people to really pay attention to the documents and treating the documents as um, sometimes even more important than some of these these objects which tend to kind of take center stage because they're pretty and they're colorful and that's what art usually looks like mm -hmm. um, and so I think this kind of um, sometimes bizarre treatment of objects in the Silverman collection, like framing letters and scores and right. scraps of paper and kind of turning them in a way into works on paper, you know, paintings on the wall um, and treating the detritus that you mentioned as, you know, something like a, something like a sculpture that was rooted in this desire to sort of take th these things seriously. So I'm, I'm curious, um, what you think are are kind of better strategies for holding on to that emphasis on the kind of non spectacular and the documentary as being where so much of Fluxus resides without resorting to this kind of fetishization. Okay, well, so um, thanks, Julia, for that question. Um, so I think that um, first of all, I guess having hung a few shows with Manolo. For Havilel, he always says you don't put something on the wall that's made like that. Like so, if it's a letter or anything written on a horizontal surface, you don't frame and put on the wall. I do agree with you though that John Hendricks did a great job in adding some sort of formalism, some ways of respecting the work. Um, even though I sometimes see it and think, you know, maybe some of it's sort of over. You know, it's got like a Rolls Royce frame or something, you know, some, some of it's kind of slightly um, overdone. But what I would say, Julia, is also um, we that, that what, what John Hendricks did is fine. You know, not all the Fluxus artists agree with what he did or how he emphasised things, but now it's a new chapter in the history of fluxes. So we don't, we don't need to replicate his model. We can um, keep what was most useful and productive of, out of it and come up with our own solutions, you know, going forward. Is that answering your question or? Other solutions, yeah. You wanted to know about solutions. Well, one thing I really hated was when MoMA did, um, 433 and had everyone you know signing up on a long list of you know you you get to do 433 you know like it was days and days of marathons of 433 but um I do think involving the audience in some way um by even if you have to make exhibition copies you know it's sort of interesting so um some solutions uh when I did the 61 show in Madrid Simone 40 came and taught all these young students of, uh, you know, how to do these moves very simply and unpretentiously, right? And then, you know, Robert Whitman came to, to Madrid when I do the New Realism show and, and taught them how to kind of do, I mean, told them to do this really rough painting and we set up um, American Moon and did his, that piece. So um, it's great that when you have the artist, that's obviously really, right, that precious thing is running out. Um, and, and the third example was that um, I asked Klaus Oldenburg if we could make an exhibition copy of the street items, and he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> so, um, so it's it, you know, and I understand because that too was a set for a performance, snapshots from the city. But he, you know, they sort of changed over the years, and 
Um, and he was doing the performance with Patty and he wasn't asking other people to enter the piece. Um, so there are very kind of subtle strands that I think we're now up to having to consider between cases that we're confronted with. I mean, also, I mean, it extends beyond conservation into say, um, you know, loaning works. Like I remember when MoMA bought Simone Forty's dance constructions and they were skeptical about loaning it to us in Madrid because it just happened and they wanted it to be theirs and they wanted to show it first. And someone said, who are they, Microsoft? Yeah. So um, they kind of wanted to brand it as MoMA's thing. And Simone actually said, yes, you can do it. You know, so um, when we don't have the artists, I hope we just have very good notes, I guess. Um, and those of us who have sort of been lucky enough really pass the information on. Okay, thank you, Jules, for your question. And uh, oh my, uh, that that can go on forever, I guess. Uh, we have one question from, uh, yeah, someone who is looking at fluxes uh, elsewhere than in the United States. And this is Magdalena Holdar. Magdalena, I'm allowing you to talk. So, and welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for this super interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I'm really, I think it's interesting to look at the object or maybe the thing if you want to give it some kind of agency and also if I mean because now we've been talking about what it does in exhibitions and how we as researchers maybe approach them uh, but have you been able have you seen in your material and in your research if the artists themselves have changed their position maybe or their relationship towards the object over the decades if you kind of trace uh, their work from the 1960s onwards, particularly maybe when it comes to the 1980s, 90s, when we have all those exhibitions coming up. Uh, do, do Can you see how they, if they somehow um, maybe embrace uh, the materiality and the object in a different way than they did before? Um, yes, when Fluxus, you know, the Spirit of Fluxus show happened, you know, it's so it's very ironic and complicated because I also knew Alan Capro and he said, none of my work should be in a museum. There shouldn't be photographs of it, all of this, you know, um, discussion. But he would, you know, we have to do it if we want to teach, you know, show the public what he did, his contribution, right? Um, and so I would say that um, this is where my effort to bring in Alison Knowles saying, you know, Fluxus landed on us, right? So um, she went on to make objects that were Alison Knowles's art and not Fluxus, right? And she had shows, just solo shows, many of them that were just, the word Fluxus really wasn't discussed, right? So she chose to, the attitude toward the object is maybe they had refreshed it enough in its status with the kind of agency of fluxus that then they could, you know, go back to it in another guise. So Alison Knowles, I think she she did do that. Um, some of the objects made a sort of, I mean, on the one hand, you have sort of art objects or sort of, or musical instruments gilded to become art objects by, people who never said they were artists, you know, who were musicians, right? So it's complicated the status of the object. And then, um, what was I gonna say, the last one? Uh, just directly answering your question, Alison. Oh, I forgot my last point. Um, <laughs> what, can you just remind me at the sort of end of your question? Well, I was, I was asking you about the, uh, if you had been able to see the the relate, I mean that basically replied already. <laughs> I would say so. Maybe I didn't have an end, <laughs> but it was like I was because I was reflecting on if if there is also sort of a moment of nostalgia, maybe uh, when looking back at what they did earlier, and if, if that's a param parameter perhaps in um, in the relationship towards the object. And nostalgia on whose part? From the artists, I mean, looking back at their own on their own work uh, over the decades, and if it's, it has this nostalgic touch, maybe I, I'm asking because I'm researching Bengta Klimberg, and and he has this sort of gap in his artistic production during the 70s and 80s, and and then he revisits his early works in the 90s, and I would say that he approaches it differently 
uh, in the 90s with this sort of more historical perhaps uh, viewpoint or, or perspective on it. That sounds, yeah, I mean, that sounds right. I think, um, you know, every case is different. Like Ben Patterson, for example, went into the real world, out of the art world. He said he's leaving the art world. And, you know, people dragged him back and said, have a show. And so he hadn't done anything for years. And and so, you know, he, he put together this show and he was happy to be back in the art world. He didn't know he would be, but so that shows sort of one thing when someone has had a huge hiatus. Um, the historical thing, of course, when everyone gets old, they want to make sure that the, the work <laughs> comes across with that kind of initial intention, I guess. So, yeah, I think they're all, all different cases, though. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Magdala, so much for your question. And uh, we have a message in the chat from um, Nadli, uh, who commented on the discussion between Jules and Julia. Uh, the choice of to frame ephemera has also empowered some uh, unscrupulous dealers to break up original publications and sell scores cards independently. So I think this is also something uh, to have into account um, in in terms of um, consequences of of certain kind of yeah fetishization fetishization <laughs> of this happening I guess on all the time. Um, I do have one question. Uh, we still have some um, some time, and uh, um, I'm kind of interested in this uh, um, in this part of your uh, presentation when you were speaking about how Cage hated improvisation, and yeah. um, yeah. and kind of referring also to this idea of um, how free we can be when we are interpreting a score, right? Yeah. And um, we had also we have touched upon this subject in this um, a talk with uh, Natalie um, last year, and I'm just wondering. Um, so I mean, the reference is is an artist, and 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 you said, uh, but, you know, I mean, it's they change their ideas. Uh, also, the cases are very different. You also wrote and spoke about different types of scores. Um, Right, but I mean, those artists um, are unfortunately slowly um, disappearing from kind of our reality. And but the question is, uh, how how we can approach yeah. this? Like, how we can know what is the right way of interpreting the score and the wrong way of interpreting the score? How we can play with this idea? Well, on the one hand, I agree with Natalie that you there's some guidance that's needed into the spirit of the artist. So um, I've before written about this and, and you know talked about it, that the uh, different ways of people having done drip music by Brecht. So Higgins, you know, up on the ladder with the jug, um, Matunas, even a bigger ladder, you know, and, and Brecht with the, just a little... Jug. Actually, the, the one that we see of Breck may even be three aqueous events. We're not sure because it's. I wanted to show you this two cups. There's another cup in the background. So anyway, the thing is that everyone will interpret it differently. And some artists care about that more than others. But I think what the um, sort of bump in the road was is that um, Cage was espousing indeterminacy and the performer putting the score together how, how they wanted. And um, then when he'd watch someone do his work and, you know, they were silly or overdoing it or something, he, he hated it, right? And he, he also, jazz was improvisation and he was chance operations, right? So he's a different part of the, um, the story. He's kind of oppositional to many others who were, you know, many of his contemporaries. So I think it's and and he's contradictory because if you say you want the performer to put together the score and I've la I've allowed all these variables, um, then you have to, as they say vulgarly, suck it up. You know, you have to kind of um, accept what gets done. Um, but Cage didn't. So he had, you know, these strong views. And, you know, it, it was a difficult moment. It was new. It was, you know, and he was getting you know, attacked on every side. So anyway, but he, um, there's less, much less, uh, you know, directions or limits or anything on fluxes, right? So that people have done 
um, crazy interpretations of things. Even when I give a whole, all the different scores to my class, they do some mad things. Um, but that sort of, that is allowed, you know, and it's um, just a question of, I, I quite liked, so with the drip music idea, um, I felt that Matunas's second um, performance of it when he was standing on the stage just dripping at human scale, not at building scale, uh, is more in keeping with Brecht and Brecht probably would have liked that more because he wanted to relate one-on-one -on -one and have, have that one person have that experience. So if you're at the top of a ladder and you've got a big, big concert hall, it becomes something else. Um, so it's just a matter of sort of sensitivity. I also um, spoke, you know, like Dick Higgins has a completely different way of doing things, you know, scream and all this danger music. And he and Pike got on very well and Pike had action music. And so he sort of tear around and do all kinds of zany, very energetic things. So they all have their different personalities. And we just, as people who are trying to, you know, be the stewards of their work, just like any other artist, we have to know what that that sort of intent, I mean, the, I, it just enriches us to know the nuances between all of them, I think. Um, it, and we, if we make them same, the same, we do so at our own peril and, and, and at the loss of his, the history. Mm, all right, that's a good answer. Thank you so much. I'm seeing um, another um, comment from uh, Jules in the chat. Um, musician friends of mine who live were um, both Cage and Derek Bailey has have always been very frustrated with Cage's stance towards improvisation. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Um, do we have um, any other questions from the public? Yeah, I would sort of say, I um, mean, just one last thing, I'd restrict improvisation. If you're too proper, doing a flux of score, it's like dry and a little um, staid and maybe boring. Um, but if you have like some, some respect for the artist and then some kind of a little bit of an idea yourself on what you could do, um, you know, that, that goes a long way. And, and so you don't completely change the piece, but um, you, you kind of think about maybe one new thing that that matrix allows you to include as part of experience. I'll just say one thing very quickly since I was asked about installations. So Breck's three chair events when it was in a show in Madrid um, was it was a nice sort of this exactly what I'm saying about this take about extending something right a bit more. So we someone an artist interpreted it and he realized that at the Radio Sophia all the staff officers have black chairs. So he goes, okay, there's our black chair. So the score says black chair, yellow chair, white chair, right? Um, and then he, the white chair we put in a gallery with a stack of scores as he did in the beginning in New York. And then the yellow chair, this artist went around Madrid and found this store called Corte Inglés. It's like a kind of Ikea. And um, he looked at, at the chair department and found a yellow chair with a price tag on it and just took a photo of it and left it where it is. You know, and so that's like a way of intelligently interpreting something that also carries something onto the audience about it lends them a little more understanding. I totally agree. Um, yeah, I just I just had a kind of a maybe small announcement in um, in relation to what you were saying because you I have seen both of your exhibition in in Vienna Sofia and I I was kind of very important to me. <laughs> kind of, Thank so. you. Mm. The formation I was very young, but uh, I didn't know what is happening, but it was amazing. Mm. Um, but uh, and there is a new exhibition actually coming of Dick Higgins in Reina Sofia. I know it's my partner who's doing it. <laughs> yes, but well, the public might not. So, kind of, no, it's um, like it's my partner. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you understand that, but anyway, we're connected. Um, yeah, so no, that's going to be exciting. There's yeah, something else special. Um, um, as far as I uh, know, there will be also some kind of work around uh, uh, restaging some some of the works. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of also curious of uh, how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's interesting. It, that Dick Higgins and Alison Oz had the something else gallery and performances that was slightly different to Fluxus. So it sort of veers off a little bit. 
Yeah, the, the coolest will be there. I have heard on the right on on the show, and I'm kind of curious how they are going to deal with it. Yeah. Um. So I think it's um time to wrap up slowly. If there is any urgent questions still somewhere there to Julia, maybe we have a space for one more. I don't see that, but um. So I would come. Maybe I will just. Because I, I mean, I have like 100 <laughs> catch up later, but um, yeah, I have this one. I, I love this and I had no idea about it. This instructions by Brecht um, of uh, medicine cabinet, mm. this is mind blowing. And I have mm. a question related to it. I mean, I haven't, uh, so this work when it is installed on exhibition, it, are there, are those instructions respected? Ah, well, that's, that's the thing. They're not. And that, that's why Casper Koenig said we can't even do this show because all the lenders want you to seal hermetically in vitrines and everything. Um, repository's hardly been shown by MoMA, but when it is, it's all covered up, you know. And so, you know, no, no one allows you to participate anymore. That's why I was suggesting as a curatorial solution a, to ask someone to think about the score and a realisation that's instructive, or B, use a real orange, an apple, whatever, and put them there and have them change, have them and rip off the calendar date and all that, and have the work feeling like it's moving through time when people, you know, experience it. Mm. Now, that's something interesting, yeah. So how to how to respect um, um, artists' will and at the same time kind of be... You know, kind of function within this kind of museum institutional setup, which is the way it is, right? So, how to find creative solutions for that and kind of stay um, uh, kind of honest and true to the work that artists did, right? In fact, definitely, yeah. All right. So, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Julia. That was really wonderful and exciting. And thank you all. Um, you know, kind of. Uh, our participants that were asking those awesome questions. It was really super nice to hear this interchange and kind of like, it was a very nice vibe, I think. Um, so um, yeah, thank you so much, all of you. Um, we are going to publish this recording on our website soon. And uh, yes, good evening or afternoon to everyone and to Julia, a good trip to Italy. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, everyone. Bye.